companies, by and large, in the US and elsewhere, have a lot of discretion in how they develop their terms of use and how they apply their terms of use. So in deciding what kinds of content you can post on their website and what you can't. Um, in a lot of cases, this can lead to good results, right? So if uh, someone is harassing someone else on a social network, Facebook can then take action and, and, and try and deal with that harassment. Um, but when it comes to controversial content, so content that is unpopular with the government or is unpopular with one group or another within society, then a broader set of interests comes to the fore. And we really urge companies to really think through uh, how they apply their terms of service to controversial content and really take into consideration the broader public's right to know and the impact on the freedom of expression rights of their users. Circumvention tools are certainly an important part of any kind of internet freedom programming. Uh, but these groups also need a lot of support and training on, for example, how to protect their privacy or security online, uh, also how to protect their privacy and security on mobile phones. Um, a lot of groups are just now beginning to incorporate new media tools in their work and their advocacy, so a lot of them are asking for training on how to do that and, and capacity building um, for how to do that. Uh, and finally, I would say that many of these groups are actually engaging in policy reform efforts in their countries. So in other words, to make sure that the internet they actually get access to once they get access to it is one that actually supports human rights. China and other governments who are more interested, or less interested rather, in democracy and less interested in uh, promoting human rights, they're going to have to grapple with two important realities. First, the idea that their citizens might want to say in their own governments, uh, might want to be able to access the information they want to without interference, uh, it's not really limited to merely Western societies. And I think this was made uh, the most clear in recent events in Tunisia and Egypt, where uh, a popular uprising really demanded those rights um, using online tools and off. Second, I think governments who don't really uh, want to promote human rights will have to grapple with what's often called the dictator's dilemma, which is that, yes, uh, many human rights activists and many quote-unquote troublemakers are using internet tools to do things the government doesn't like. But these tools are also being used by uh, ordinary citizens to engage in economic activity, uh, to communicate with family and friends. And I think it's really difficult uh, when a government tries to block the human rights activities or political activities on these sites because it ends up blocking a lot of economically valuable activity and um, just general everyday speech that citizens care about. I will say that the, the idea that bad internet policies, policies that violate human rights or that impact free speech or privacy online, it's not limited merely to repressive regimes. And countries like the US and other Western democracies are also able to pass laws that undermine openness and freedom online. I think we often forget that the open and free internet we all enjoy, or that at least some of us enjoy, didn't come about by accident and is actually the result of very specific choices uh, made in both law and technology. And as governments are really struggling with some very legitimate policy concerns, like protecting children, uh, enforcing copyright, or protecting national security, uh, we need to be very vigilant in ensuring the policy choices we make around these difficult issues don't also undermine the free and open internet.